بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين ونصلي ونسلم على خاتم النبيين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Respected elders and brothers, my dear mothers and sisters, respected listeners, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I welcome you again for the second session that we have as we go through the beautiful story of Surah Yusuf. It's a beautiful Sunday morning. Unfortunately, some of the golfers had to cancel their golf games this morning because of the cold, but some others went to the gym and did a bit of exercise, which is also important. Let us just talk about um, exercise for a little while uh, because indeed we need to understand that we as Muslims have to recognize the amana, the trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in our bodies. Unfortunately today we find as Muslims we don't really look after or take care of our bodies especially when we eat or uh, in regards to the exercises that we are supposed to perform. So we find that we overeat and we do less exercise and some other people go to the other extreme whereby they don't eat, they starve themselves and they suffer the various uh, diseases and sicknesses related with the disorder of eating. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So going to, uh, to do exercises is ex extremely important. Obviously the environments that we do it in, especially for the ladies, is important. Um, walking is, is, is very good, especially for the ladies. Alhamdulillah, I've just seen uh, the Islamic school that we have here, the large grounds. Uh, I don't know if they facilitate the ladies of the Muslim uh, community in Indonesia to do walks, etc. But if they did, that's a very good idea. And if they don't, maybe they should look in it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. Now, yesterday we started with um, this tafsir and uh, we mentioned how important this surah is, especially in relation to our daily lives. It is a school as I said yesterday, and uh, we said we'll try and go through the tafsir, assimilating and associating the different lessons taught to us uh, in this uh, chapter that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We will try and assimilate these lessons with the difficulties that we find the Muslim ummah going through today. Now, obviously, Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam is a very honorable prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is from the prophets that Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal asked us to take guidance from, to take lessons in goodness from. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِهِ دَاوُودَ وَسُلَيْمَانِ وَأَيُّوبِ وَيُوسُفِ أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ هَدَى اللَّهِ فَبِهُدَاهُ مُقْتَدِي That from the offspring of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam is Dawood alayhi salatu was salam and Sulaiman and Ayyub and Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam. These or those are the offspring and prophets that were guided and we should take guidance from them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who truly understand this guidance. Of course, it is a great ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are from the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam first and foremost. But as we go through the different communities, and alhamdulillah, you know, Allah has, has made it easy for myself especially, whereby I've been given the opportunity to meet different communities and different societies, in especially uh, we're talking about or in relation to the youth of um, the different societies. And we see that we have, mashallah, a very big Muslim ummah, especially in regards to the youth. However, what I've realized, you know, after meeting these different uh, communities, different societies, and seeing the different youth, that we have to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for being Muslim first and foremost. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us after granting us Islam, then we have to thank Him double and three times more, and in fact many times more. Today we have our youth who are Muslims by name, but totally misguided. A'udhu Billah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. They are suffering the evils from the environments that they are living in, and indeed we are all living a life which is a test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed us here for a limited amount of time. Thereafter, we will return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and answer uh, for our actions on earth, this is not a place uh, of abode which a Muslim or anybody will stay forever. Indeed, this world will come to an end. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us to Him upon true guidance. And many a time I've spoken about this. You know, the parents have to revise themselves, especially 
in regards to the upbringing of their children. Many a parent tends or they tend to neglect the responsibility of upbringing. You know, being a mother, being a father is a very great responsibility. And inshallah, we'll cover it as we're going to, uh, through this uh, tafsir. I have no doubt that in, it, that in it, there is a lesson for the parents as well as the children. Now, um, just as a recap from what we took yesterday, we discussed the reasons for revelation. And we mentioned that um, from the books of tafsir, two uh, reasons have been given. We mentioned that the one was the Jews going to the idolaters, the mushri and telling them that go and ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about Yusuf alayhi salatu wa sallam because Yusuf is from the brothers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the same family lineage and if he doesn't know then we will have exposed him because also Yusuf alayhi salatu wa sallam was one of the prophets of the Jews he was from the descendants of Ishaq alayhi salatu wa sallam and inshallah, as we begin today's lesson, we will be discussing the family lineage of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. So they said, go and ask him about Yusuf. If he doesn't know, we would have exposed him not to be a prophet. And if he doesn't know, and behind your people's backs, they come or he comes to us, meaning Bani Israel, and ask us regarding Yusuf, we would have exposed him again. And I did mention that after everything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed them. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you or your people didn't know about the story before we revealed it to you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the surah in its entirety and that's one of the reasons why we said the surah is unique it's a story from beginning till end that speaks about the events that happened to one prophet so that is one of the reasons without going into great detail the second reason we discussed was that Obviously, we know the Muslims were going through a difficult time. The new Muslims, they accepted Islam. They were being oppressed by the Quraysh. They were being oppressed by the disbelievers. They were sanctioned. They had to go to Abyssinia. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was sanctioned as well. And uh, he went to Ta'if and he was oppressed over there. He thought after not getting any hope or not having no signs of hope in Mecca, after all that da'wah, he thought, let me go to Ta'if, maybe we'll get a better or a better response from them. But they oppressed him, they mocked at him, they jeered him, um, they stoned him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. And he was obviously oppressed. He came out of there very sad, uh, demoralized. As the Muslims were going through a difficult time, it was a very difficult period. As uh, we said yesterday, the surah was revealed also towards the end of the Meccan period, revealed in Mecca, according to the majority of the ulama of tafsir. It was towards the end of the Meccan period. So they went through great difficulty. He had lost Khadija radiallahu anha. He had lost Abu Talib. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, narrate to us. And as I said yesterday, um, normally we find from a story with good moral teaching, a bit of inspiration and a bit of, you know, something to boost ourselves, something to give us hope. So they asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to narrate to them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Nahnu naqussu alayka ahsan al-qasas, we reveal to you the best of stories so that was in regards to the reasons of um, revelation then we discussed briefly uh, the separated letters because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began the surah with alif lam ara and we said that uh, going through the books of tafsir we found at least 15 reasons to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually separated these letters from the most um, uh, common um, speech of the ulama of tafsir regarding the separation is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used 14 of the 28 letters uh, in the Arabic language separately. You know where we said alif lam mim, alif lam ra, yasin, noon, etc. As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is challenging the disbelievers saying that look, these are letters that you read, these are letters that you use to write, these are the letters that you put together to make beautiful speech and poetry. We're challenging you with the same letters that you use to come up with Al-Quran, which we said is totally impossible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised to protect the Quran. And in fact, the Quran is in a level of its own, especially in regards to the grammar, in regards to its expressiveness, the balagha, the morphology, etc. There is no comparison. Nothing can compare to it and nothing will. And we can even swear by that. So we discussed that. Then we also mentioned from the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, that inna anzalnahu qur'anan arabiyyan 
that we revealed to you this Quran in Arabic. We said we derive from that many uh, rulings. We don't want to go through everything again, but obviously it's good to summarize, especially for those who might be taking notes. We said that the Quran exists in its, its, uh, exists in its Arabic form. A translation of the, of the Quran cannot be called uh, Quran or Al-Quran. It cannot be called Al-Quran. It is called a translation of the Quran because in the translation man is involved. Man is involved and man is prone to error. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from error and a Muslim scholar who deduces rulings from the Quran is not allowed to deduce rulings from a translation of the Quran but from the Arabic version itself as it is understood in the Arabic language. Then we spoke about the actual meaning in regards to Ahsan al-Qasas, uh, whether um, it is whether Surah Yusuf is actually the best of all stories or whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Ahsan al-Qasas meaning all the stories in the Quran are the best of all stories the ulama have uh, mentioned uh, two different reasons in any case all the stories in the Quran respected listeners are of great moral teaching we take lessons from them we take heed from them we take inspirations from them and we aspire ourselves by reading them may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those and towards the end I mentioned an important aspect that today we speak about how we read so many books I mean we can mention names I mentioned a few names yesterday something uh, names which come to mind right now Jeffrey Archer John Grisham I mean Inad Blyton we can mention all the names of books that especially our young Muslims are reading and reading and reading big bulk uh, bulky books, I mean the Harry Potters, oh, it's not a small task to read those kind of books, but they have so much interest, or oh, we as parents also have interest in reading these books. However, how many times have we actually read the Quran? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it easy for us by making it, or by allowing it to be translated. And today we have a translated version of it in the English language and various other languages. How many of us have actually sat down and actually read this uh, translation cover to cover knowing that it is the constitution of a Muslim it is a book of knowledge it is the light of a believer at the end of the day we are only here for 60 years we need to live this 60 years 70 years that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us uh, a long life today people are dying young I mean we hearing of people having heart attacks as early as 30 may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a long and healthy life full of his obedience I mean, so how many of us have actually taken the time to actually read our own book? And this says a lot about the Muslim Ummah today. The interest we have in our deen, in educating ourselves in regards to our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in regards to the do's and the don'ts, and the don'ts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed on us. Remember, when Islam came, it came with the aspect of do and don't do. La ilaha illallah means do and don't do. For Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, it was not to do. He wasn't supposed to eat from the tree and for Iblis it was to do he was supposed to bow down to Adam alayhi salatu wasalam so he didn't do Iblis didn't do and he was cast out of Jannah and he was cursed and Adam alayhi salatu wasalam was supposed not to do and he did and thus breaking the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the day dear listeners we are not slaves of our desires we are the slaves of one Allah Rabbul Izzati Wal Jalal the creator the sustainer the nourisher we find ourselves today being totally negligent of the do's and don'ts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed on us remember this world is the prison of a believer in the prison you live but you are governed by certain do's and don'ts and it's the paradise of a disbeliever because they are not confined to do's and don'ts. They do what they want, when they want, how they want. And then in the akhirah, there is nothing for them. Now we, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, granted us this life. And in fact, he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اشْتَرَى مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَنفُسَهُمْ وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ بِأَنَّ لَهُمُ الْجَنَّةِ That Allah has bought your lives, your health, your happiness, everything from you. Because He has given you Jannah. So really... We find ourselves, alhamdulillah, happy, we have good children, we have good health, etc. This is the mercy from Allah that after He bought it from us, He still gives it back to us out of His mercy. And on top of that, if we are good, He grants us Jannah. So how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. In reality, respected elders and brothers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Fatir that if we wanted, we could have got rid of you. 
in seconds quicker than the blink of an eye and come with a new creation who will worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be worshipped وَمَا ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِعَزِيزِ and that is not difficult for Allah رب الْعِزَّةِ وَالْجَلَالِ may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding so yesterday we stopped just moving on with the tafsir at the aspect of the lineage of Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam we said that Yusuf is the son of Ya'qub, who is the son of Ishaq, who was the son of Ibrahim, who was uh, titled Khalilullah alayhi salatu was salam. And we said that Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam had two sons. One son's name was Ishaq, and the other one was Ismail alayhi salatu was salam. And we again mentioned that all prophets came from the lineage of Ishaq alayhi salatu was salam, except one prophet. All other prophets came from the family lineage of Ishaq alayhi salatu was salam except one prophet and that one prophet was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who came from the lineage of Ismail alayhi salatu was salam now Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam used to be in Iraq that was the area that he used to be in and when the jealousy struck and happened between the wife of uh, Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam and the maid the Hajar of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam the maid servant Ibrahim left Ismail alayhi salatu was salam and his mother Hajar in the area known as Mecca. And we know the story of the running between Safa and Marwa and the well of Zamzam. That's a story related to Hajar and Ismail alayhi salatu was salam. So there was the jealousy aspect between the wife of, of uh, Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam and the maid servant Hajar of uh, Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam and Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam left Iraq and went up to uh, the point or the place known as Mecca and left which was a barren land and left Ismail alayhi salatu was salam and uh, his mother over there now as a point of mention this story in reality is the beginning of Banu Israel the story in reality is the beginning of Banu Israel, because they are the descendants of Ya'qub alayhi salatu was salam. Ya'qub alayhi salatu was salam, who is the father of Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam, had 12 children. And thus, the 12 different tribes of Banu Israel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ithna ashara asbatan umama, the 12 different uh, tribes. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised Ishaq and Ya'qub that Palestine was theirs as long as they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the last prophet. Allah promised Ishaq and Ya'qub, and as I said, this is the beginning of Banu Israel, that Palestine was theirs as long as they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the last prophet. Now, when they rejected Isa alayhi salatu was salam, when Banu Israel rejected Isa alayhi salatu was salam, these favors were taken away from them. Because remember, the condition was, you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the last prophet. So when they rejected Isa, alayhi salatu was salam, these favors were taken away from them. So, this is uh, as far as the lineage of Yusuf alayhi salatu was I hope I haven't complicated things, but this is just to give us a brief understanding to the reality of the beginning of Banu Israel and who was Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam and Ya'qub. Remember we said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam referred to him as Nabi ibn Nabi ibn Nabi ibn Nabi, a prophet who was the son of the prophet, who was the son of the prophet, who was the son of Khalilullah Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam referred to Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam as Kareem ibn Kareem ibn Kareem ibn Kareem because uh, Kareem meaning Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam son of Kareem who was Ya'qub alayhi salatu was salam son of Kareem who was uh, Ishaq alayhi salatu was salam son of Khalilullah who was Kareem as well Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam so Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam continuing after discussing the lineage now tells his father Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says نحن نقص عليك أحسن القصص بما أوحينا إليك هذا القرآن وإن كنت من قبله لمن الغافلين and we also mentioned the aspect of غافل not meaning ignorant but meaning that you weren't aware of the story then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that from amongst the stories we, we narrate to you O Prophet of Allah is the story when Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam when Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam said to his father O oh my father indeed I have seen in a dream Eleven stars and the sun and the moon. I've seen, the, I've seen eleven stars, the sun and the moon 
prostrating down to me. Inni ra'aytu ahada ashara kawkaba wa shamsa wal qamar ra'aytu hum li sajideen. So Yusuf narrates his dream to his father. Eleven stars, the sun and the moon prostrating to him. Now the ulama of tafsir, the majority of them have mentioned that the 11 stars as we we know, I told you the story begins with the, with the dream and ends with the translation of the dream and at the end of the dream Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala interprets this dream for us meaning the reality um, comes into play where the 11 stars turned out to be the brothers and the sun and moon uh, uh, representing the mother and father. Now majority of the ulama of tafsir mentioned that the sun here depicted the mother and the moon depicted the father because in the Arabic language obviously it is a language which has gender casing so everything is feminine and masculine and in the Arabic language although the Sun is big huge and bright it carries a feminine gender and the moon even though it takes light from the Sun it carries a male gender masculine gender however uh, some other ulama actually said that the moon depicted the mother and the sun depicted the father Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best so Yusuf speaks about his dreams now dreams respected elders and brothers my dear mothers and sisters and listeners the dreams of the prophets are actually revelation they're just not uh, any normal dream that you and myself would see and inshallah tomorrow as a point of interest, I'll come to you with a bit of research regarding dreams. Um, what we should make of them, which dreams we should take into consideration, what we should do if we see a good dream, a bad dream, etc. We'll discuss that tomorrow. So uh, for those of us, um, maybe we could pass the message on to the others. It might be a point of interest because we always uh, get frequent questions regarding dreams. However, dreams of the prophets, uh, dear listeners, are actually a revelation. Imam al-Tabari mentioned the narration by Ibn Abbas, radiallahu an. And Ibn Abbas obviously was a prominent Sahaba, well known, especially to those studying fiqh. He was from the fuqaha of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum ajma'in, from the learned um, group of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. He says that dreams of the prophets are revelations. Remember, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam saw himself slaughtering his son. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Safat, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wassalam sees himself slaughtering his son. Now this just wasn't a mere dream that you wake up and say, oh, I had a bad dream. It was a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inni ara fil manami. Oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what Ibrahim alayhi salatu wassalam said to Ismail alayhi salatu wassalam. Inni ara fil manami anni adbahuka fandur madha tara. That indeed I have seen in my sleep that I am actually slaughtering you. So what do you have to say about it? Now obviously he wasn't asking his son for permission here. He wasn't asking his son for permission that look, um, this is what I've been instructed. What's your view? As if he's asking his permission. He's just uh, testing him and seeing what his reaction would be to it. And Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam with the great character and belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Oh my father, do as you have been instructed. Satajiduni insha'Allah min as sabirin Insha'Allah you will find me from those who are patient. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us offspring who are obedient to their parents. And before being obedient to their parents, obedient to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as mentioned by Aisha radiallahu anha in the first few hadith of Bukhari used to see dreams six months before his prophethood. So six months before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him in the cave he used to see dreams and whatever he used to see in his dream used to become a reality immediately. It would actually come true. In another hadith uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions that dreams are 1 over 46 and that's a fraction of prophethood 1 over 46 of prophethood now some of the ulama have actually tried to explain um, this fraction uh, found in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and some of them have said that look Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was receiving divine revelation for 23 years because his prophethood was 23 years so he was receiving real inspiration for a period of 23 years and six months before that as we seen in the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha which is authentic in, in Bukhari six months before that 
he used to see dreams which would come true. So 6 divided by 23 gives us a fraction of 1 over 46 and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So this is a brief uh, uh, lesson in dreams for us that they actually are revelations of the Prophet. In another hadith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that nothing has been left after prophethood, divine revelation except mubashirat. When he was asked what is mubashirat, he said good dreams. Now inshallah tomorrow we will before uh, beginning with the tafsir, a little lesson discussing the dreams as I mentioned before the different topics uh, that really uh, we find the public questioning today. After that, or before reading the next ayah, what do we learn from this? Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam sees a dream. What does he do? He approaches his father. This, and just when we started the tafsir today, we were mentioning about parents upbringing their children, the relationship between parents and their children. And I said that insha'Allah I have hope that in this uh, tafsir we will find a lesson in it. From the uh, uh, story of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam we will actually find a lesson in regards to the father and son relationship, in regards to the parent and child relationship. Here it is, respected parents. Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam didn't feel uncomfortable going to his father telling him, Oh my father, I've seen this in my dream, please assist me with it, etc. This shows the open door policy that, Ibrahim, that uh, uh, the father of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, who was Ya'qub alayhi salatu wasalam, had with his son. Today fathers unfortunately find themselves creating this barrier between them and their children. That's one extreme. Or they enter the other extreme where they can't even speak to their children, they let them do what they want, they feel that guiding them at this age or at the age that they are would be a means of them rebelling later on etc we find this un-islamic um un uh, meaning thinking which is beyond somebody's sense beyond common sense islam as i mentioned in many of my lectures before when we were dealing with uh, parenthood and um, upbringing of children islam dear listeners is not a religion that tells us that look go and get married and then learn how to be a good husband. It's a trial and error session. Go and get married and through trial and error, learn how to be a good husband. Indeed, Islam doesn't teach us this. And Islam in the same uh, sentence doesn't tell us that, listen, have a child and then through trial and error, learn how to bring up this child. This is, this is not the teaching of Islam. Islam, respected elders and brothers, is a deen which is complete. It is a way of life. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never left any stone of goodness unturned except that he turned it and taught it to us. He turned it and taught it to us. It is we who are not thirsty in learning from the wealth left behind after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which is knowledge. So we find parents today going to one extreme whereby they feel the relationship with their son, with their daughter, with their child has to be this kind of king and servant relationship where don't do as I do, do as I say, I command you, you follow. And this is a policy that is not um, Islamically correct, especially in the age of science and technology, especially in the time that we live in, we, our children are influenced by vices outside the home. And um, in the UK, if we, look in the, uh, if we look at the situation in the West, we find over there that children have the abilities to go to the various uh, civil uh, services such as the police in case their parents try to discipline them and teach them. So what happens is parents are reluctant, they're not willing to try ulterior ways and different motives and we find these children going astray and then when it's too late and we try to bring them back, we find them being truly in, in, in the true word or the true sense of the word rebellious and they rebel and then they go and use uh, different services available to them and actually end up being an oppression to their parents. How many a parent today, and this is also for the parents listening to this broadcast right now, how many of us actually look at our children and find them to be the coolness of our eyes? You know, Alhamdulillah, we, um, many a parent has approached seeking assistance in dealing with their children. And when I look at these parents, I don't think for one moment when this mother and this father had the child or when he was just born and he got a slap at the bottom and began to cry that this uh, mother or father for one moment thought that this child would ever be the depression. In fact, every time they looked at this little child growing, it was the coolness of their eyes. However, now, Years down the line, 
after failing drastically in upbringing this child and he's rebelling against his parents, we find parents looking at their own children and those children are being the sorrow and distress of their heart. Now, in reality, this is something which we need, that needs to be looked at. I mean, it's something which exists, we have to point it out and parents have to make amends. At the end of the day, as I always say, that a child's mind is like a glass of water. A child's mind is like a glass of water. When the glass is full of water, we say it's full of a compound known as H2O. It's full of water. But if we empty this glass of water, is the glass full or is it empty? So some might say it's, it's empty and others might say it's full. In reality, respected parents, the glass is actually full. It's not full of water, this time it's full of air. It's not full of H2O, which is water, it's filled with air. And your, child mi your child's mind is just like that. Your child's mind, my dear mothers, my dear fathers, will never, ever, ever remain empty. If you as a mother, if you as a father, don't fill your child's mind, that mind will never, ever remain empty. The television at home will do the filling for you, and his bad friends at school will do the filling for you. So don't ever feel that your child is young. Today we live in an age of science and technology. When we were uh, little and used to cry, our parents might have come up to us with a little rattle. And they used to rattle this, this rattle, and the sound that it used to make would stimulate our minds, and it would interest us, and we would be interested in this rattle. Today, try taking a rattle uh, to this child, to a newly born baby, who's six months, seven months, eight months old, and try rattling it for this child. He or she is not interested. A child nowadays needs a little computer console that you push buttons and electronic sounds come out. Those sounds actually stimulate a child's mind now. And this is proof of the advancement of the children nowadays. They are maturing at a quicker age. They are becoming more understanding at a quicker age. Don't ever feel that your child is too young when it comes to his upbringing. Don't ever feel that your child is too young before you correct him. Correction starts. And in fact, the upbringing of your child, my dear mothers, doesn't begin when your child is five or six years old. It begins from the time that your child is in the womb of its mother. It begins from the time when your child is in you, O oh mother, in your stomach. That's the time that child rearing and upbringing actually begins. You have to watch what you eat, you have to watch how you speak, you have to watch your diet, you have to watch what you listen to. You know, we find so many times little children, two years old, they don't understand what is salah, but they see their parents reading salah and they go stand next to the parent and he, uh, he or she will do ruku, will do sujood, sijda, and they'll get up and they're copying this motion. They don't know what on earth they are doing, but because they they are seeing their parents doing it, what happens? They follow, isn't it? So if you in the home, as a mother and father, are negligent of your children, first and foremost, they'll grow up to be negligent of their children, if Allah doesn't guide them. The second aspect is if you listen, if you grow up with music in your home, a vulgar language in your home, you know, oppression, if the mother and father are not getting along properly, this will have detrimental effects to the child at an early stage and he'll grow up with his perceptions, perceiving that that's the way life is. And then what happens in the future? We have a bunch of children who have grown up to be unworthy citizens of the communities that they live in. And this is the biggest thing we are trying to avoid, especially as a Muslim. A Muslim is always a contributor to society. A Muslim always contributes to society. And what we need is for our Muslim youth to be contributors to society, worthy citizens of the communities that they live in. Today, unfortunately, because they are uneducated and they come from homes that, that they didn't receive foundational upbringing, we find them to be followers instead of leaders. And thus, the, backwards, the backwardsness of the Muslim Ummah today. If you've practiced your deen, respected elders and brothers, and we're not trying to be biased and say deen is the only thing, but it's a reality. It is the only thing. Islam is not just salah, zakawat, sadaqat, uh, fasting and going for hajj. It's a way of life, the way you conduct yourself in every avenue. No university is going to teach your child how to be a human being. No university is going to teach your child good manners. It is Islam that governs the way you conduct yourself as a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something that has to be understood. So parents 
And this is all what we're speaking from when we understand how Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam went to Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam, the open door policy. Parents need to open their doors and be more lenient towards their children. Give them the time. Don't overwork yourself and feel that that's how you can best raise your child by bringing in so many rands, so many pounds, so many dollars, so many euros so that you can provide your child with the best education and the best PlayStation, the latest one and the latest Xbox, etc. And because you're so busy giving your time to the material standing of your child, you forget giving him foundational uh, assets, which is your time upbringing him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. So we learn from Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam going to his father and telling him of this dream which he had, the open door policy that should exist between fathers and their children and mothers as well, uh, and mothers and their children as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. We also learn from here that we should not narrate our dreams to those who would get jealous of us. So what happens is Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam with the open door policy that Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam had, he went to him and he narrated the dream. After that Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam advising his child says, Ya Buniya, and this again falls under the explanation that I was giving just now between the open door policy. Son talks to father, father then advises the child. Ya Buniya, la taqsus ru'yaka ala ikhwatika fayakidu laka kayda. That, oh my son, don't narrate this dream of yours to your brothers because they will plan an evil plot against you. So we learn from here first and foremost the father-son relationship. We spoke about it. We don't want to go into it again. Then we are also taught that we shouldn't narrate our dreams to those who would get jealous of us. And in the same context, we shouldn't narrate our achievements or plans or programs that we may be involved in. And this is important. Because nowadays, if you go out boasting about the certain things that you may be achieving and doing, you might find that people would step in and put a stop to it. Maybe through the evil eye or maybe through jealousy, they would pull some strings, etc. And uh, just saying this now reminds me of a saying of the Salaf. And in fact, some of the muhaqqiqin, muhaddithin, the scholars of hadith have actually mentioned that this saying is not just a saying of the Salaf, it's marfu' to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and is actually a teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The saying is, Ista'inu. عَلَىٰ قَضَاءِ حَوَائِجِكُمْ بِالْكِتْمَانِ فَإِنَّ كُلَّ ذِي نِعْمَةٍ مَحْسُودٌ That assist yourselves in the things that you do by keeping them a secret. Assist yourselves in the things that you do by keeping them a secret. For every owner of a blessing is envied. And this is a fact. Today we find jealousy spinning the Muslims. Because it's the work of shaitan to spin the Muslims and he's using this to spin us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. We find Muslims who are so jealous of their fellow Muslim brother who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed. And they end up saying, why him and not me, a'udhu billah? Why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given him and not given me? So, istainu ala qadai hawa'ijikum bil kitman. That assist yourselves in the things that you do by keeping them a secret. Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam, being a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, recognized the lessons from this dream. And he knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has great plans for Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. So he recognized the meaning of this dream. That indeed Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam is going to have great status and great honor. Allah has something big in store for this boy. So he said, in essence he's saying, حوائجكم, Keep it a secret. Don't reveal it to your brothers. Even though they are your brothers. They will plan against you. Then he said, That indeed, shaytan to mankind is a great enemy. So it's not from mankind just to go out and attack their own brothers, but weakness of Iman and shaitan's strong grip over them could lead them to do something that they wouldn't even want to do if they really thought about it again. So he tells his son, and this is a father advising his child, how many fathers have in this day and age actually advised their children against shaitan, advising them how great an enemy he is. Inna shaytana lil insani adu mubin. The father of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam is advising him that indeed shaytan to mankind is a great enemy. So here respected elders and brothers, we are taught shaytan's position in regards to man. Now, it's no secret to us that the enmity between shaytan and the children of Adam began a long time ago. A very long time ago, from the time 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salatu wasalam and shaitan got up very proudly and said, Ana khayrun min. He got up very proudly and said, I am better than him. I am better than him. So this pride that he showed and he refused to answer the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sparked the enmity between Adam alayhi salatu wasalam and his children and shaitan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us shaitan's uh, message to us in Surah Al-A'raf, which is in the eighth juz, where Shaytan says, "Thumma la atiyannahum min bayni aydihim wa min khalfihim wa an aymanihim wa an shamailihim la ilaha illa Allah." Shaytan is telling Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that I will attack them, I will come to them min bayni aydihim from the front, wa min khalfihim and from behind, wa an aymanihim and from the right, wa an shamailihim and from the left. Wa la tajidu aktharum shakirin, and you will find the majority of them from those who are not thankful. So shaitan's intent is only to attack us and spin us and we find him today sparking our hearts with jealousy against our own brothers. Not our own Muslim brothers, but against our own blood brothers. How many times have we heard a blood brother cursing his own brother from his mother? The son of his own mother, he's cursing him and saying that today, and Audhu Billah, it's a statement which shouldn't even be said, but it's a fact, many a time we have heard this, that if I saw my brother, my blood brother, and an animal on the street, I would rather help the animal, Audhu Billah. This is, this is something, this is a statement that is not worthy for a Muslim to speak or to say. So we need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protection from shaitan first and foremost, and especially from jealousy. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Iyakum wal hasad. That stay away from jealousy. Don't even come near it. Iyakum wal hasad. Fa inna al hasada yakul al hasanat kama takul al nar al hatab. Because indeed, jealousy eats away the good deeds. Jealousy eats away the good deeds just as fire eats out firewood. Just as fire eats up and burns fresh firewood. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala His protection. Indeed, jealousy, respected elders and brothers, is a reality. We need to stay away from it. We need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his protection. We don't want to go on qiyamah, uh, stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after reading years of salawat and giving millions in zakawat and performing so many hajj. But then we spent our lives being jealous of our Muslim brothers and Muslim sisters, speaking out against them, breaking relationships with them. Unity is something which is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and unity is something which is most hated to shaitan. Unfortunately, we find the Muslim ummah today specializing in pleasing shaitan and that is disunity and displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is to be united. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْرِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا Hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together. In a hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَرْضَى لَكُمْ ثَلَاثَ وَيَكْرَهُ لَكُمْ ثَلَاثَ That Allah loves for you three things and He hates for you three things. And from the things that He loves is He loves you to be united, holding on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us unite.